Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica, and I'm a bookseller at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PNP Live. Thank you for continuing to join us in this virtual format um, in the midst of these extraordinary times throughout all of which we continue, we strive to continue to bring you the, the authors you love and their work to um, the literary community. At any point during this event, you can click on the links in the chat to purchase the starter point and a burning um, on the website. Additionally, you can ask them a question by using the ask the um, ask a question feature, which is found on the bottom of your screen. And we will try to get to everyone's questions, but we apologize in advance if we can't. Finally, we want to thank you for being with us here today. We're so thankful for our family of loyal customers and new friends for keeping our business and our spirits afloat. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's guest. Sahima Anam is an anthropologist, novelist, a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, and an opinion writer at the New York Times. The debut novel, A Golden Age, won the 2008 Commonwealth, Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Book. She is also the recipient of the Writers Prize and the o. Henry Prize, and named one of Granta's best young British novel novelists. Her latest novel, The Side of Wife, has been called Spectacular, a powerful statement on the consequences of public achievement on private happiness by Publishers Weekly. Um, she will be in conversation with Mega Majumdar, um, who is the New York Times bestselling author of A Burning, um, which is now paperback, which was long listed for the National Book Award, short listed for the a National Book Critic Circle John Leonard Award for Best First Book and the American Library Associated Andrew Carnegie Medal Medalist. She's also the editor-in-chief at Catapult, where she continues to bring aboard literary nonfiction and fiction authors. Please help me in welcoming to in welcoming Tahima Anam and Mega Majumdar to Politics and Prose Life. Welcome. Thanks so much, Jessica. Um... And hey, Tamima, I'm so excited to speak with you. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, the Startup Wife, which is the book that publishes in the US today that we're celebrating today, is so funny, so inventive, so thoughtful. Um, and I think, Tamima, you'd like to do a short reading. Um, perhaps you'd like to introduce it in your own words and do the reading. Great, thank you so much, Megha. It's so lovely to meet you and I wish we were sitting in the bookstore ourselves because I would have wanted to meet you since I read your wonderful book last year. Um, and thank you to everyone at Politics and Prose and everyone who's out there listening. I can't see you, but I can feel you. Um, so my novel, The Startup Wife, is about a coder called Asha Ray and she comes up with a, uh, an algorithm um, and builds a startup with her husband, Cyrus Jones, who's like her high school sweetheart. And the book is about their marriage and about uh, their startup and about the tech world and what it's like to be a woman of color in the tech world and what it's like to be married to a person who runs a business with you. And when sort of love and work and marriage and power all kind of collide. Um, so I'm just gonna read to you for like one minute from the beginning of the book when Asha comes up with this idea and presents it to Cyrus, her husband, for the first time. Um, so I got a letter today from some people in Missouri, Cyrus said. He read aloud, Dear Cyrus, my wife and I grew up watching Little House on the Prairie and we both have this yearning to kneel beside our bed at night and say some kind of prayer. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that without invoking a higher power? What if we could put our palms together, look up at the sky and do some real talking about the day, about the things that had gone wrong, the things that we were okay with, the things that we hoped might happen tomorrow. Could we do that? Could we do that and just enjoy it? We don't want to cheat on our atheism. Gee, Sai, if only you could give every skeptic what they wanted, some kind of believable replacement for God, Jules said. Jules is like their best friend. Well, I said, I did propose that to Cyrus, but he wasn't sure. I didn't say I wasn't sure. I said, I don't want to be a priest. Jules looked back and forth between me and Cyrus. You want to give this man his own religion? I just thought I could code an algorithm that would allow people to get a kind of Cyrus ritual, you know, a combination of all their things wrapped up in a little modern package without the sexism, homophobia, and burning in the fires of hell of actual religion. You know, Jules agreed, that's not a bad idea. People might actually go for that. 
I shrugged. It's up to Cyrus. What's wrong, Cy? You don't want to be the new Messiah? I'll stop there. That was wonderful. Um, I had so much fun reading this novel and I kept wondering, how did you come to the idea for this book? And how did you write the tech world with its, you know, lingo and kind of make fun of it, but in a very tender way sometimes? How did you do all of this? Um, thank you. Well, first of all, I'm glad to hear that you had fun. I really wanted this book to be a joyful experience. And I say that as a person who has not written particularly joyful books in the past. Um, and I, I felt like when I was writing this book, I had a tremendous amount of fun. Um, all the jokes that I'd been storing up my entire life, I got to put in this book. <laughs> all my crazy ideas for startups, I got to put in this book. So it, it was really fun to write and I wanted to convey some of that joyfulness. Um, in the actual writing. Um, I would say that uh, the idea, so I am a startup wife. My husband runs a tech company in London and I've been on the board of the tech company. Now, the difference between me and Asha is that, um, I mean, I'm not giving anything away when I say that, you know, Asha comes up with the idea for the company, they launch it, it becomes really successful and people start to look to Cyrus um, as the kind of power um, center of the company. Um, and the startup is called Why. It's pronounced Why Are We Here? And it's spelled W-A-I, We Are Infinite. Um, so people think of Cyrus as the kind of spiritual leader of why. Um, and the difference between that and my life is that I'm on the board of my husband's startup. It was totally his idea. He didn't take anything from me. <laughs> I'm not the brains why the opera. <laughs> but because, I, um, because I've been on the board, I got to kind of be in the startup world and kind of observe it a little bit. And Mega, I, I imagine that you have this experience, but one of the great joys of being a novelist is that anytime you have an experience, you file it away somewhere. So if I was in a boardroom and people very often would ignore me or talk over me or not ask me for my opinion or make a kind of sexist joke, um, I would feel pretty offended, but then I would be like, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> and it gave me this little thrill. The novelist's revenge. Yes. And even if I didn't actually put any real things in the book, um, it, it was sort of fun to think about how I would write about this world and its lingo and its rituals and its culture and its own particular breed of machismo and um, kind of capitalism, you know, in its new form. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where the idea came from. I was spying on my own life. <laughs> um, the, the main couple at the heart of this book, Asha and Cyrus, they are so fascinating and they are so complex, you know, Asha in particular, um, and, and, you know, the ups and downs of their relationship, their marriage, and their relationship with each other as um, co-workers of this incredibly successful thing that just explodes. Can you talk about writing these two characters? Sure. Um, I would say that probably one of the biggest criticisms of this book is that Cyrus is not as fleshed out as Asha. Um, and I think, you know, I probably just hold my hand up and say, I probably didn't write him as well as I wrote her because I just loved her more. Um, I loved him too, but I loved her more. <laughs> but I think, partly, I think partly it's because, you know, she has this fantasy about him. She falls in love with him when they're in high school and then he disappears and he's always a bit of a mystery to her. And she is really taken with the fact that when they meet each other again, he kind of loves her back. And she takes all of that childhood admiration and she puts it into her adult marriage, probably not to great effect. Um, having said that, I wanted the love story to be real. You know, I mean, it, it is among other things, it's a rom-com and I didn't want you to feel like, I don't really believe these people are really into each other. Like I wanted to feel invested in that so that the question, which is like, are they gonna be able to stay together through all the ups and downs of running a business and all these intense power dynamics that come up in this whole kind of journey that they go on that you really care whether they stay together or not. And so I, you know, 
I wanted it to feel real. And partly that was giving them a backstory, which is that they knew each other since they were kids. And um, Asha knew Cyrus's mother who passes away. And then he's, you know, extremely attached to the memory of his mother. And um, Cyrus knew Asha when she was like a really geeky high schooler. And um, before she comes into herself, um, and so they have, there are these echoes from their childhood. And then of course they just have a lot to talk about. They're super into each other. They're, there's a lot of sexual chemistry. Um, yeah, so that's, that's them. And obviously um, there's a lot of that at the beginning. And then as the realities of working together and being married to each other kind of play out, the situation obviously becomes more. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking about what you said about the criticism of Cyrus. Um, I would disagree. I think his mystery is part of what makes him really compelling, that he is this kind of reclusive or, or quiet person who kind of reluctantly got involved in this and then found himself at the center of it. But we should chat about that over drinks someday. Um, <laughs> Now you described the book as a rom-com and that is such a fun way to look at it. But one aspect of it, which I was really moved by is it asks these really profound questions about people seeking meaning and you know, people facing mortality, the power of rituals, the ways in which people are constantly seeking sites for meaning making in their lives. Um, how did you get interested in these questions? Um, so I trained to be an anthropologist. Um, I, I always knew I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't have the confidence. And I, I, went, to, I went to America from Bangladesh on a student visa. And I knew that the only way that I could stay is if I continued to be a student. Because I, you know, I was basically unemployable after getting my very wonderful liberal arts degree that I luckily <laughs> got a scholarship to get. Um, so I was in college, and um, I was I, I majored in anthropology because I found it really fascinating, and I had an amazing kind of teacher. And then I thought, well, I really want to write novels, but what can I do to sort of pretend to be doing something else? So I was like, I'll get a PhD in anthropology, and so by some miracle, I was accepted into a graduate program. And I was like literally going to class and writing my first novel in the margins of all the books I was reading. I mean, this is like a, such a writerly cliche where you're pretending to do one thing. But in this <laughs> case, I was pretending, I was pretending to be like a very obedient Asian daughter and getting my PhD, making my parents very happy. And in the meantime, thinking of this other life. But as it so happens, it was a really good move because um, anthropology uh, has had a deep influence on my writing. And in this case, it's had a very direct influence. So as anthropologists, we study ritual, we study the symbols and we study rituals as the kind of scaffolding on which so much of our social and cultural life is based. And um, in this case, I was trying to give Cyrus and Asha a startup that was very unlikely, and and you know one of the one of the struggles that they have to raise money and to kind of succeed before they eventually do is that people think they're like hippies and they think they're like socialist entrepreneurs and they don't really get them. And I did that um, because I wanted them to be outsiders in the startup world, so that they look at it in the way that we look at it. They look at it with fascination and with slight kind of you know, cringy sort of like, what is this world really about? And I had to give them a startup that was kind of non-traditional enough. And, and then I took that with my sort of interest in ritual and religion. And I just had this idea, which is like, what if you could have a social media company that was based on the things that you, that give meaning to your life? So let's say, um, the people who wanted to, to pray in front of their beds at, at night, but they didn't, but they're atheists. And, or, you know, when my son was born, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if he could have a baptism? I, I just think that's so wonderful. Um, but what if it was like a baptism written by me about the things that me meant something to me? So that's what Cyrus does. He gives people bespoke atheist rituals, and then Asha turns all of that into an algorithm. So this is a very long-winded way to answer your question. 
It was partly to do with my training as an anthropologist and partly to do with, I functionally had to give Cyrus and Asha a slightly weird startup to kind of make it believable that people like them would end up joining that tech world. I love that. I love hearing that you studied anthropology because I did too. I know. Um, and it's so much fun to meet like a fellow. Well, I, I left my PhD, so I didn't finish it, but a fellow yeah. anthropologist in training at some point. Um, we were in the same department, right? Were we? Oh, I yeah, didn't know that. I think we were. Yeah, I think we were. Um, anyway, we can talk about this over and over. <laughs> yes. Um, now the book is also filled with these really, every time I read descriptions of the other startups that are in the book, you know, other startups at the incubator and just people that Cyrus and Asha meet in this world. I was like, does this exist? It sounds like it could exist. Um, do you ever think about, I know you're on the board of your husband's startup, but do you ever think about being an entrepreneur or tech person yourself in a more full-time way because you have all of these ideas which I was like I should google whether this exists um I'm gonna put the so basically I had so much fun creating uh I'm gonna hold on here we go panelists and attendees so I had so much fun uh creating these startups that I created a fake website for them and <laughs> if you go to the website it will look like they're all real um, so basically Cyrus and Asha, once they launch Y and their friend Jules, they go to this place called Utopia, which is in the meatpacking district in New York. And it's a place where other quirky startups get to be together. And I, and I had to create all the startups that were in that world. And so there's like a totally silent vibrator. There's like a, a guy who makes like food out of electricity. Um, and in fact, and, and then there's, you know, there's consentify, which is where you have to pre-agree to all your sexual activity before you engage in it. Um, there's vitamin vaping where, which is like really, <laughs> vitamins. So yeah, I just came up with, um, it was really, really fun. And I'm sure that I don't have the grit and the kind of audacity and the ability to sell things that would require that would be required for me to actually launch these startups but I can definitely come up with really outlandish ideas um and you know that was just another flight of fancy I guess oh I love it um it's I mean another aspect of what made the book really fun for me is the dialogue is so funny and I imagine that there are lots of writers in the room with us right now. Can you talk about what is your advice for writing dialogue with just sparkles like that? Um, thank you, you're so kind. So I had this, I went on kind of a journey with this book um, because my three other books were so different. And I felt a huge amount of anxiety about what was going to happen to my career if I, if I actually published this book. I had a great time writing it. And then I went to my editor, I went to my agent actually, and I said, I, this book was not written by me. This book was written by my alter ego. And my alter ego is like so much funnier and more confident. And she just says whatever she wants. And she says like, F you all the time. And I had to take out so many curse words from this book because at first there was like way too many because I just, <laughs> I just, I just could have said whatever. Um, and she kind of said, you know, if that is what you want, then, you know, that's what we'll do. Obviously, she did not think this was a good idea, um, partly because her job, you know, she's an amazing agent and she supports me and she wanted me to kind of stand by my work. And it took a lot of, you know, introspection and a lot of self kind of motivation for me to say, well, the same person who wrote those books is also a person who wrote this book. And in terms of the dialogue, um, I think that I wrote the way that people talk more than the way that I was thinking, which is what I did in the other books. And I remember when I was in a drama class in high school, once my drama teacher made me go out for a month and write down what people were actually saying. And it was so incredible the way that um, dialogue when you write it can look so fake. But if you go out into the world and just like and write out what people are saying, then you can sort of 
capture something of the cadence of their voice. And um, I, you know, and Asha's voice is like every girlfriend that I have, you know, every kind of hilarious WhatsApp conversation I've had with my friends. And um, it's just, yeah, she, like I said, I, I think I was just saving up my sense of humor. <laughs> all these years and it just came on this book and maybe there's not going to be another one like it because I used I used it all up and that's it I'll be dead serious from now on <laughs> I don't know I really hope you'll write more funny books as well um, I want to um, dig into that conversation that you had initially because it's mentioned I think in the acknowledgments as well if I can bring this up um, which is that you initially considered publishing this under a pseudonym because um, the book is, is so very different from your previous three novels. Can you take us into those conversations and your thinking as much as you're comfortable doing? Oh, totally. And I actually want to ask you this, Mega, because when I wrote my first novel, I was not thinking about my career as a writer. I was writing the book that felt deeply urgent to me. You know, that felt like I, you know, I come from Bangladesh. I grew up hearing stories about the war and I just had to write those stories. I had to write that story. That was like a burning thing that just came from within me. And then I wrote two more novels that were like a sort of trilogy. So I was following the fortunes of this one family. Um, and obviously like I needed to write those books and I stand by those books and I love those books. But I, I think that I was also in a way I was writing the books that people expected me to write because there are not a lot of writers who come from Bangladesh and people were saying to me like, oh, you're giving us a window into this world. And we thought your country was X, but now we see that it's more complex than that. And it can be very powerful to be, to, to be given that sort of privilege. And it's hard to say no to that. You know, it's hard to say no if someone's like, well, you know, there's, there's a kind of representation that exists in the media about a place like Bangladesh. And here's your opportunity, which is why I wrote those columns for the New York Times. Like, here's your opportunity to um, complicate that, you know, to give people a different view, a novelist view, a, a nuanced view of that world. And I, and I felt when I wrote this book, I really felt like I was, I don't know, maybe somehow not honoring that responsibility or, or somehow trashing that by being like, ha ha, I just want to tell lots of jokes and write about silent vibrators, you know, just kidding. I was really serious before. And I just thought, what if I just completely messed up, you know? Um, and, and the way to hedge my bets was to publish under a pseudonym to say, okay. And it wasn't the pseudonym. It was like, it was like, this is my alter ego she writes these kinds of books and then this is this is the literary me and she and this is the me and this is my passport name and this is she writes and i don't know if uh you have an embarrassing bengali nickname Mekha, and if you do i think you should tell us what it is because i'm about to tell you mine i was my nickname it was rose <laughs> it was like such a such a you know classic that doesn't even sound like a nickname though i thought you would say something truly embarrassing yeah, I know. I, know. I, I, I do. I do have friends nickname. I do know someone whose nickname is Pussy. And that's like people just call it that. Baby is another very common yeah. one. Baby mm -hmm. is like totally uh, pinky. Uh, anyway, so Rose is my nickname. Uh, I was named after the Rosetta Stone, thanks to my dad who studied, uh, I don't know, classical What history. a story. I love that. And so I was like, <laughs> this novel was written by Rose, not by Tamima. And so um, I just, um, I, yeah, like I said, I had to go on a journey. Wait, you haven't told me your nickname yet. I don't have one actually. I've never had one. I've been one of those rare Bengali oh. kids who everybody would say, you know, Tumar bhalo name or dak nam ki, and yeah. I would just say Megha, you know? So, <laughs> You're one person. I'm Your spirit is not divided into like a serious <laughs> one and a sort of, you know, slightly comical name. Um, yeah, I think that um, I internalized a lot of expectations around my own writing. And because I, because I think that rom-coms and comedies written by women are already slightly less kind of valued in terms of high art, 
all of those things came together to create a deep anxiety in me that I was kind of making a huge mistake. And, and even though I knew that there were some real serious things that I wanted to say in this book about tech and about the way that we underestimate its power and about women and marriages and, and how women give their power away in marriages. Like I had some really serious things I wanted to say. I had just never said them in that form before. And I was concerned that somehow I wasn't gonna be able to pull it off. So it was just a crisis of confidence and we all have them, but it was just born out in this attachment to a pseudonym or an alter ego that I then happily abandoned, so. Well, I am so glad that you chose to publish it under your, um, under your name, because I feel like, you know, part of what you're doing with this book is exactly pushing back against those expectations that, you know, a writer from Bangladesh has to write only one kind of book. And I think you are opening doors for other writers who want to write comedies or sci-fi or speculative or, you know, whatever, and just your imagination cannot be constrained by those expectations. And I'm so glad you, you pushed past that. And, and now you've given us this amazing book. Um, I'll take a second to remind everybody watching um, to buy this book. It's the pub day here in the US. Um, support Tamima and support Politics and Prose, which is a fabulous bookstore by ordering the book. I think Brittany put the link in the chat, so it's very easy. Click it before the window closes in, in a while. Um, and also be sure to put your questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the screen, and we will get to those um, really soon. Um, so one thing that I want to talk about is this is also a novel of New York. I love how you've written New York in this book. Um, you live in London now, but you lived here before. Can you talk about writing New York from, from far away? Yeah, so um, when I was seven years old, um, my dad, so we, I was born in Bangladesh. My dad got a job with the UN when I was two years old. So we lived in Paris uh, for, until I was seven. And when we moved to New York, we moved to Queens. We lived in um, Kew Gardens um, and I didn't speak English. I only spoke Bangla and French. Um, and uh, I went to a local French maternelle. So I, I spoke Bangla and French. And I, um, I, we arrived in New York and I just remember it was 1982 and my parents were like completely intimidated by New York City. And so they moved to Queens because there were some other Bangladeshi families they knew in Queens. And it was this incredible journey for our family from going to a city, from going to, from Dhaka, which they had never left, um, moving to Paris and living in a country where they didn't speak the language, but eventually falling in love with Paris and then moving to New York. And what happened in New York was everybody blossomed. You know, my mother who had not been working when we lived in Paris. She went to CUNY, she got her master's and she was working on like suicide hotlines and in soup kitchens in, in New York City. And she was seeing a part of the city and just, they were no longer like those immigrants that arrive and are so afraid of New York. I sort of watched them unfurling and falling in love with this incredible city. And by the time we left a few years later, it had had such a huge effect on all of us. My mother had blossomed. I obviously learned English and I got this accent, which I then never shed because I learned English in New York and um, it was incredible. And I have like deep memories. And so um, we, I've lived there on and off over the years. I spent a year there uh, as an exchange student when I was doing my PhD in the anthro department at Columbia. Um, and then the summer before I started writing the book, uh, my family and I moved to Queens for a, a period of time and I had all these incredibly vivid memories that came back to me and I just, I love New York. I love Queens, you know, and I felt like, oh, I, this is my place. And it's so weird that thing that New York does where even if you go back after a long time, you still feel like it's yours. And I don't feel that way about London. I love London. It's my home. I've lived here for 20 years, um, but maybe not 20 years. Anyway, it feels like 20 years because the last two years have felt like about a decade, but, um, but somehow New York, it just, 
it's like when you fall in love for the first time and then you like see the person again over the years and you, you know it's never going to be like that but somehow they, they own a part of you forever that's how it feels it's beautiful i love how you're talking about new york um I'll ask maybe one more question and then we'll start going to the Q and A's. Um, so you mentioned, you know, you've written a trilogy of novels before, which were very, very different. Um, can I ask you, you know, what excites you as a writer at this stage in your writing life? What are the obsessions that you think are emerging in your work? What are the departures that you see emerging in your work? Um, wow, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. Um, I think that it's, you know, it's been, this is the fourth book now, although lots of people ask me if it's my first, and I, I don't say it's my fourth, because then I have to reveal to them how, you know, long it's been, and so I say, oh, it's not my first, but <laughs> it's not my first. It's Rose Lanham's first. It's, it's my fourth book. Um, I think that, uh, I have always been and will always be uh, interested in telling the stories of women and, and power. I think that's my deep obsession. I think it's a political commitment. I think it's one that I'm really proud of. I'm a card carrying feminist. You know, I come from a tradition of feminism in Bangladesh and in my family. Um, and it's funny, I gave this book to my mother and she did not like the number of FUs there are in it. But <laughs> she said, she said, oh, I cried at the end of this book. And I was like, you cried at this book? You should have, I understand crying in the other ones. Why did you cry in this book? It's supposed to make you laugh. And she said, well, this is, this is a woman who you, you created this woman to be the most unlikely person to fall under the thrall of patriarchy, to be somehow diminished by a system that is greater than her. And, and, and even she um, struggles, you know, even she isn't able to completely inhabit her own strength and her own power. And, and obviously that made my mother very sad uh, because she's been a feminist campaigner her whole life and she wants young people to sort of be completely um, unshackled uh, and completely free. So, so I think that is my story. I think that is my abiding obsession is to tell the stories of women and how they lose their voices and how they get them back. I love that. I can see, anyway. <laughs> no, I can, I can see crying at the end of this book because I loved the end. It is such a powerful end. I do not want to ask anything about it and give it away, but it, it, was, it was a really, really powerful end. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the questions um, from Katie Sullivan. It seems like there's so much racism and sexism in the tech world. Do you find this to be true? Um, male CEOs who act like they're gods, is that something your book is interested in? She hasn't read it yet, but ordering today. Um, that is definitely one of the major themes in uh, the book, so much so that I wanted to exaggerate this point, which is that male CEOs are revered by making Cyrus into a slightly spiritual character and making Y into kind of replacement for religion. Because even though it's supposed to be an, a non-religious thing, he still starts to get looked at as a cult leader. And Asha says to herself, like, how is it that I built this algorithm that makes millions of people literally worship my husband. <laughs> that is just so, you know, ironic. Um, so it's definitely that. I think the thing that I would say about the tech world is that it is the world. So in all the ways in which the world and the workplace is sexist and in all the ways that, that capitalism has bred generations of white male leaders who are then looked upon as the kind of pioneers and the new inventors and the Bransons who go to space and the, you know all of that. Tech is just a part of that. The interesting thing about tech is that it's been sold to us as an alternative culture, that it's, it's, it's pitched as being disruptive and as breaking down barriers. And if you go on the websites of any tech company, it's just, it's like, we're gonna revolutionize the way you eat. We're gonna revolutionize the way you sleep. And it's, it has this illusion 
of, of having a kind of radical um, philosophical position, but it is just replicating the structures of power that already exist. And that is the great irony, I think, of technology. Not that I don't love it. I think it has amazing possibilities and I feel incredibly fond of that world, as you pointed out. It's just that we need to give it the same, see it through the same critical lens as we look at any other forms of power. Absolutely. Um, there's a question from an anonymous person who says, what do you think the future of AI is and how will it affect our relationships? We've already seen that um, social, well, we've already seen that social media makes it easier to cheat and leads to divorces that wasn't even thinkable in the 1990s. I'm not sure if I agree with that, but let's think about the future of AI and relationships. Okay, I can't comment on divorce, um, but I, and I'm so thrilled that you think that I have any authority to speak about this. I guess what I will say is similar to what I just said about tech, which is that I think that artificial intelligence being built by people is gonna have the same strengths and the same weaknesses as humans. So we know that all of our unconscious bias and our indeed our corruptible bias is reflected in AI. And so it is not going to save us. It's, it's not going to be an intelligence that is purer than us. Um, it's going to have the same flaws that we do. And so we're, and it's going to have the same weaknesses. So I don't think we should fear it because it's us, but, but nor should we look to it as being a sort of higher form of, of intelligence because we're gonna build in all the things that we, there's no shortcut. It's not like we're gonna build uh, artificial intelligence that's kinder and more empathetic and less biased and less racist than we are as people. Um, we're gonna have to figure that out for ourselves and the machines are not gonna do it for us. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Nikki who asks, did you start writing this book during the pandemic or did that come up when you were already writing and you worked it into the story? That's a really good question. So. When Asha and Cyrus and Jules get to Utopia, the person who heads Utopia, her name's Leanne, she says, we are here to, uh, per, you know, to recreate the world after an apocalypse. So we're thinking of all the things we're gonna need in a post-apocalyptic world. We're gonna need food, we're gonna need religion in the form of why, um, whatever it is, that's the sort of brief, if you wanna get into Utopia. And they're basically apocalypse preppers. And I wrote that before the pandemic. And then there was an actual apocalypse. And I thought, I can't not put this in my book. I can't like take this away from my characters who have been waiting for this moment. They're like, there's gonna be an apocalypse. And then there is one. Um, and so when I was doing the rewrites, I, I ended the book and this is not giving anything away. I ended the book right at the beginning of the pandemic before there was a lockdown in New York. You're just getting a sense that there's gonna be a major shift in the world. And I just felt like, you know, I couldn't resist basically. Can I sneak in a question since you're talking about, about writing and revising, can I sneak in a question about your writing routine and your, your creative routine? What does that look like? Um, so you're seeing me in my new office, which I only just got a few weeks ago. And I love it so much, but I'm also a bit afraid of it because I feel like in order to deserve this office and this bookshelf, I have to be a way better writer. Every time I sit down here, I'm like, ooh, do I deserve to be here? <laughs> um, and this is all to say that I, um, my first two novels were written before I had children. And I had very specific quirky routines that I would love to say to people like, I write in these notebooks by hand with a certain pen and then I transfer everything to my computer and then I edit it 200 times. Um, I'm still editing 200 times, but after I had children, it was like all just completely gone. I have no routine. I wrote The Startup Wife on a sofa in my living room in the sort of one or possibly two hour stretches when I didn't have some kind of mothering responsibility that I had to attend to. Um, and I certainly did the editing in lockdown when I was, we were trying to homeschool and I, I stole like two hours every morning. Um, and yeah, so I really would be lying if I told you that I had any kind of routine. I just wanna tell you that this 
this office is so amazing that I don't say that I'm going to my office. I say, I am ascending. I am ascending. It's on the top floor of my house. I'm ascending to my office. So I think I'm just going to have to come up with a whole new, whole new life in order to befit this incredible kind of backdrop that you're looking at. And I, I'll keep you posted if I, if I come up with something worthy. Oh, I love it. Those bookshelves are gorgeous. Um, so nice to finally have, have your own space. Um, there's a question from M. Lung. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. What books have you read recently that you'd recommend? Have you, oh, and here's the second one. Have you started or thought about your next title? I'm not sure if they mean the next book you're going to write or the next book you're going to read, but perhaps you can take on both. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, so I uh, loved Catherine Heine's Standard Deviation, which is a great rom-com with some very serious themes. Um, and I think she has a new book out, which I recently purchased, but then hid from myself because I knew that I wouldn't be able to give it its due because I've been on Zoom a lot and doing a lot of book promoting. So it's kind of there as a little gift for me. Um, I'm just reading Jillian Tett's Anthrovision, which is how to see the world as an anthropologist, uh, which I Ooh. find really, really fascinating and I recommend to everyone. I think she's probably the world's most famous anthropologist because she interprets um, world economies through a cultural lens and it's always really, really fascinating. Um, so I love that book. And then I'm also reading Elif Shafak, Island of Missing Trees and I love her work I think it's just she's just getting better and better she's also a great model for how prolific one could possibly be she has a book out like every two years so um, maybe now that I have this office I can channel a bit more a leaf <laughs> um, and and it's wonderful it's it's a new book and it's really really great and as far as me um, I I have some ideas but I'm still debating which one is going to come out on top and I'm having this sort of like comedy, tragedy, little two people on my shoulders. Um, so we'll see, we'll see which one. Maybe I'll go back and forth just so I can remind myself that I can be super, super serious um, and tell, write a whole novel without a single, single joke and then go back. I don't know, we'll see. Do you ever work on more than one book at once? Oh my God, no, do you? No. But there are magical people who do. Really? Yeah. Like two novels? Sure, I think so. I feel like I've heard writers say in interviews and conversations that, you know, they have one project and then they kind of sneakily write a second book at the same time. No, I'm glad it feels as like wild to you as it does to me. That's crazy. I want to find out who they are. You have to tell me later. So I can, <laughs> if I can stalk them online and be like, I don't believe you. <laughs> um, here's a question from another anonymous person. Do you have any tips for writing humor? I find it so hard to make something funny on the page. That is a great question. <clears throat> and I would say that just write whatever makes you laugh. And I, I definitely think that in, it's harder to make people laugh than to make them cry. I mean, you can make people cry like this. There's like 10 things I can tell you right now um, that would just bring tears to anyone's eyes. But laughing is so particular. And also um, you have to find your own funny bone. In other words, like I do not understand British humor. I think it's one of the reasons I just don't, I don't <laughs> feel British. I, I can watch British TV and I just don't get it. It's so awkward. Everyone's just kind of awkward and making these weird, they're sort of like this, they don't say much. Um, American humor, like, you know, there's a kind of British equivalent of like the late night TV, you know, things that you watch like John Oliver and stuff, never get the jokes. Watch John Oliver, I think it's like super funny. So this book definitely had to be set in New York and it had to be about people who had a more American sort of sense of humor. So I think I would just start with what you find funny and start really, really small because it can't be funny all the time. Um, it can only be funny like maybe 20% of the time. And the rest of the time you have to be talking, making them do something else that's not funny. That sounds so weird, right? Do you know what I mean? 
No, I, I know what you mean. I, I like the idea of just kind of being very particular and paying attention to what makes you laugh. I mean, your comment kind of makes me think about the British version of The Office versus the American version yes. of The Office. Yeah. Yes, it's so cringy. It's just too far. I just completely don't get it. But like, if I was writing Bengali humor, it would be all about wordplay. It would be all about rhymes. You know, it, it's a bunch of Bengalis. I mean, one of the best Bengali humor scenes are in Vikram Seth's A Suitable Boy, because she goes to this Bengali family and all they do is just say poems back and forth to each other, like little word plays, little rhymes. And it's a cliche about Bengali people that they're always singing and writing poetry, but it's true. So I think it's just, you know, you have to find your particular, almost like a culture of two people and what what it is that makes them have that sort of moment of humor and seeing seeing each other's funniness. Yeah. Um, I might ask you one last question before we bring Jessica back on screen. Um, so I'm so curious about, you know, you've written four novels now, you write for the New York Times. Um, so it sounds like you kind of toggle back and forth between various modes of writing all the time. How do you balance that? Um, and how do you see yourself as, as a very particular kind of writer for each of these, um, for each of these writing tasks? Um, thank you. I, that's a great question. I think that they really help me. Each of them helps me do the other thing. So I have very strong political opinions and I have things that I want to say. And if I tried to put them all into my novels, they would be very, very laden. Like the characters would be just puppets for my political opinions. And nobody wants to read that, right? So I need to have an outlet. I need to say, be able to say things directly. And writing nonfiction can often be that. And then as I'm getting older, I find a kind of memoir sort of personal essay style to be um, very nourishing to my spirit because we go through these experiences in life. And in the same way that I was mining family history for my earlier novels, I'm sort of mining the present. Um, you know, I had, I had a very severely premature son who was born uh, eight years ago. And I had this deep sort of sadness about this experience. And then two years ago, I wrote an essay about it and it helped me so much. It was an incredibly healing and sort of, it was an experience that really helped me put words to something that had been unspeakable to me up until that point. And so I just think that, as I said at the beginning, I think that it's an incredible privilege to be a writer and to go through life, having the opportunity to put everything somewhere. And when I want to be angry and deeply opinionated, I have somewhere to put that. And I think that if I, you know, I, I have a story to tell, I have somewhere to put that. So I think it's, I think it's a function of privilege and I, I feel incredibly grateful, but, but I think it also, one sort of feeds the other, or at least one limits the other scope, which in a good way. Yeah. Well, I hope that we will get to read a memoir from you at some point. I feel like that's maybe coming. I, I certainly hope so. Um, for everybody watching, please get your copy of The Startup Wife from Politics and Prose. It publishes today. So everybody wish Tamima a happy pub day. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Tamima. This was really Lovely. I'm so glad I got to spend time with your hilarious, thoughtful, provocative book. And I'm so glad I got to chat with you. Thank you, Mega. You are an incredibly generous interlocutor. Um, being such an accomplished novelist yourself and giving me this opportunity to talk, um, you know, endlessly about the startup wife. Um, I'm so grateful. Thank you to everyone who was listening and thank you to politics and prose. Um, I couldn't think of a better way to even if we, it had to be virtual. And Mega, I must take you out for that drink when I next come to New York, but that will be pending. I would love that so much. We will have to make it happen. Let me know when I'm you're in New York. Eight, right in front of everyone. This is awesome. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much.